Here are the most interesting facts about the Airlander. Number 8. Largest Aircraft Ever Over the years, there have been some massive aircrafts that have been built. Of course, aircrafts transport a huge range of things, everything from cars to lots of people. But even the Airbus A380 pales in comparison to the Airlander. The Airlander is a little over 298 feet long, putting it about 62 feet longer than the Airbus. That's a lot to put into the air, and it occupies a big amount of space. You may be wondering how such a huge aircraft stays in the air. The answer is simple. All that space has a capacity of packing a million cubic feet of helium. If you didn't know, helium is lighter than air, and between 60% of the Airlander's weight is supported by the helium. The rest of the 40% is generated aerodynamically by having a wing-shaped hull. The engines can be rotated to provide an additional 25% of thrust up or down to help landing, take off, and hover. If there's one thing that distinguishes the Airlander from other aircrafts other than its humongous size, it has to be the way it looks. Not only is the aircraft huge, but it's also shaped pretty much like a big butt. Come on guys, you see that, right? Because of its interesting looks, it was given the nickname the Flying Bum. But before you make fun of the Airlander 10 for its shape, try to remember that it's that unique shape that contributes to 40% of the vehicle's lift. Number 7. Applications The Airlander was initially designed for the military, which we'll get into just a bit later. But since it's no longer bound by any contract whatsoever, it can be put to use in a variety of ways, and that's got a few people pretty excited. The most obvious use of the Airlander is in cargo and freight, because it has a capacity to carry around a 10-ton payload, and the Airlander 50 can carry up to a 50-ton payload. Yeah, not too imaginative with the names, right? The Airlanders are environmentally friendly for air transport, as it uses between 20 to 40 percent of the fuel and operating costs of equivalent traditional aircrafts. Its fuel consumption and ability to be in the air for a long time makes it an option for luxury air travel, much like a cruise. The revolutionary design of the Airlander allows it to float around heights of 3,000 to 4,000 feet. Because it flies that low, passengers can open the windows to breathe in some fresh air during the flight. The Airlander also has a sizable flight deck, with four large floor-to-ceiling windows providing a high level of external visibility. The Airlander can offer great views for luxury travel, as it can ensure uninterrupted views of cities it will be flying over, especially at its flying height. Its creator, British manufacturer HAV, which stands for Hybrid Air Vehicles, is already thinking of installing floor-to-ceiling clear panels along with large windows on the Airlander to make it the perfect sightseeing vehicle of the future. Number 6. Army Commission So how and why exactly did the Airlander come into existence? It was initially commissioned by the U.S. Army for the purpose of surveillance. The original Airlander was known as HAV-304, and it was originally built for the U.S. Army's Long Endurance Multi-Intelligence Vehicle Program. The Army wanted an unmanned aircraft that was capable of surveillance over long periods as well as providing intelligence. The HAV-304 made its maiden unrecorded flight in 2012 at a secret U.S. military facility in New Jersey with David Burns being the chief test pilot. The Army gave the contract to have, but budget cuts forced the Army to abandon the project. So how much did it cost? The project cost between $154 million and $517 million, depending on the options. Seems pretty expensive, but maybe that's just us. Even though the U.S. Army scrapped the project, Hive didn't want to let all the effort they had put in go to waste. So, they bought the rights to the airship from the military. Hav received a grant of $5.1 million from the UK government and some generous support through crowdfunding, including support from Bruce Dickinson, the lead singer from Iron Maiden. Number 5. Construction The Airlander 10 and Airlander 50 is a combination of a blimp and an airplane. Because of its hybrid between a plane and a blimp, its construction needs to have some very special techniques and materials to make the Airlander come to life. The hull comprises of a skin that's made of composite materials that include Kevlar, 
polyurethane, and mylar. The Airlander 10 lacks any internal framework, and weight from the payload module is distributed across every frame through cables running into the hull, as well as internal diaphragms. To provide maximum lightness, the rigid structures are manufactured from a selection of carbon fiber and glass fiber materials. The hull is divided into six compartments, with the help of diaphragms which can each be sealed individually to prevent damage in one part from spreading to other parts. However, the coolest part is probably its defense. According to Hive Chief Test Pilot David Burns, if anyone tries to shoot down the Hive with a missile, the danger is relatively low, as the missiles can pass through the airship without forcing it down. We'll call shenanigans on that one, but hey, they know more than us. The skin on the hull is supposedly capable of handling small arms fire and other causes of tears because of built-in redundancies and relatively low pressure difference between the inside and outside of the hull. That one we can believe. Number 4. Design The Airlander was designed to achieve flight and lift through aerodynamic and aerostatic forces. That's why it has an elliptical shape with a contoured and flattened hull. The best part of the Airlander is that it's meant to take off and land from a wide variety of terrains, including water. When the Army had initially commissioned the Airlander 10, they were looking for a vehicle that could take off or land just about anywhere on any sort of terrain. Do we really need to go into how great it would be to land an aircraft without the need for an airport as long as the terrain is suitable? When Hav was designing the Airlander 10, having long flight times was absolutely necessary, as it was being made with long periods of surveillance in mind. So they decided to make use of helium-filled chambers to keep the aircraft afloat. The fact that helium is used is what makes the Airlander capable of staying in the air up to five days at a time. Researchers have also calculated that it can pull seven tons of cargo over 2,400 miles at speeds of a little over 30 miles per hour. Number 3. Propulsion The Airlander 10 is powered by a total of four 325 horsepower V8 diesel engines that provide the thrust for both flight and maneuvering. These engines are positioned in pairs, one set being located towards the rear of the airship, while the other set are positioned alongside the sides of the forward fuselage, mounted on stub wings. Each engine is furnished with a 50 kilowatt generator, which provides electrical power for the airship and its mission systems. The assembly for each of the side-mounted engines can be pivoted 20 degrees in either direction in order to assist in takeoff, land, and also steer the ship during flight. The rear-mounted engines, however, are fixed. While cruising at altitude, propulsion can be switched to a more efficient electrical drive fed from the airship's central generator. The fuel is primarily contained within the 40 feet long main fuel module, housing up to 9 tons of fuel. The main tank is supplemented by separate rear and forward tanks, each of which contain up to 4 tons of fuel. Number 2. Operation Because the Airlander 10 was being developed as a military vehicle with surveillance capabilities, it's been equipped with remote controlled operations. That means that technically, the Airlander can be flown without a pilot. The Airlander 10 is a revolutionary aircraft, which takes on features of a blimp, helicopter, and airplane. It has a top altitude of 16,000 feet and can cruise at speeds of up to 92 miles per hour. The Airlander is designed to be able to take off and land in winds of up to 35 knots. However, the biggest threat is adverse weather conditions, such as high winds or thunderstorms. The threat posed by windy conditions is, of course, because of its vast surface area in comparison to most aircrafts. However, its cruising speed allows it to outrun severe weather most of the time if it needed to. You guys know what else is cool? It's actually designed to survive a direct Class A lightning strike. The Airlander also has de-icing protection for the engine intakes, sensors, propellers, and cockpit windows. Why only those things? 
because the rest of the aircraft really isn't significantly affected by icing conditions. Number 1. Test Run Issues do you guys remember the R-101 crash that took place back on October 5th, 1930? Or maybe you guys are more familiar with the Hindenburg crash, which took place seven years later. Since the airlander is an airship like the R-101 and the Hindenburg, there were and are still some obvious apprehensions about it. Of course, the airlander doesn't suffer from the same design flaws. Remember the composite materials it's made out of? Those materials can withstand small fires. Unfortunately, the aircraft had some major issues during its test runs. While things went smoothly during the first test run of the Airlander 10, the second test flight ended with a crash. Although it was a gentle landing as it came into contact with the ground nose first during its final approach and suffered extensive damage to the cockpit. Thankfully, there were no injuries as the crew was unharmed. The cause of the crash was because its mooring line had gotten caught on power cables. The airlander crashed again on another flight test as the airlander broke free from its moorings. This automatically pulled a safety rip panel so that it would deflate and fall to the ground, which is exactly what happened. Nobody was on board, but two people received minor injuries in the accident. Here's what's next. Island of New Zealand. This airport is one of the very few airports in the world that has a railway line intersecting the runway. Seriously, just why'd they plan it in that way? The Gisborne Airport has three grass runways and one main runway that's intersected by the Palmerston North Gisborne Railway Line. The rail route is still active.